Everyone was ravenous when they broke for lunch shortly after noon. Ted put on an apron and a chef's hat and took charge of the grill while the others went back to the kitchen to get the hot dogs, hamburgers, potato chips, and paper plates. Ginny brought the chainsaw out and cut down several small dead trees, then sawed them up into short lengths that would fit into the bricked-in barbecue. She brought the last of them over to Ted, who already had several hot dogs going, and then she carried the chainsaw back inside, since she didn't like to leave it laying around. Come and get em, Ted shouted at the top of his lungs. I'm right here, said Jeff, standing about a foot away, holding a plate, and shaking his head. No matter what Ted did, he always managed to get carried away. Ginny stopped just outside the cabin and looked over her shoulder. She had that funny feeling once again, that sense that she had just barely caught some movement out of the corner of her eye. But when she turned around, there wasn't anything there. She went inside and safely put the chainsaw away in the storage closet. It was the sort of thing that could really cause a nasty accident. One slip and it could easily slice through muscle and sever an artery before the chain caught on some bone. Maybe she was being a little paranoid, but it was better to be safe than sorry. As she headed back to join the others, she found herself thinking about Jason Voorhees. Perhaps it was because Paul's story had set her imagination off. Or perhaps it was because the psychology student in her was fascinated by the tale. She wondered if the legend could possibly be true. What if the boy had never really drowned at all? What if he really were still alive? His mother was obviously a psychopathic personality. Apparently nothing was known about his father. There was no reference to him in any of the stories about Camp Blood or in any of the newspaper articles about the killings. What if the pathetic, disturbed child had run off into the woods, perhaps to escape abusive parents, or maybe to get away from the cruelty of the other children, or possibly just because the search for him had caused him to hide, because he was afraid to get in trouble? She recalled a story she had once read about a search for a missing retarded man in the Pine Barrens of New Jersey. Exceedingly shy and with the mind of a small child, the man had eluded searchers because every time he heard them getting close, he hid from them. It could have been like that with Jason. They had given him up for dead stopped searching for his body, and closed the camp. What must it have been like for him then, she thought, living alone and frightened in the woods, existing like an animal? How had he been able to survive? She shook her head and pushed the thought out of her mind. It was, of course, only a hypothetical situation, something that only might have occurred. It would have made for a fantastic case study if it were true, but then someone would surely have discovered him by now. It had been a long time since all that happened. The boy had drowned, and that was that. She didn't know why she was dwelling on this. There was plenty of time to think about abnormal psychology when she got back to school. This was supposed to be her vacation, and she'd never be able to enjoy it if she couldn't kick back and relax. Everyone was sitting down to eat by the time she returned. Ted had a hot dog in one hand and a barbecue fork in the other. His mouth was crammed full, and there was mustard dribbling down his chin. Flourishing the fork as if he were a conductor leading an orchestra, he looked as happy as a kid in a mud puddle. Where's Terry? Ginny asked, looking around. Ted mumbled something with his mouth full. She didn't understand a word and asked him to repeat it. He swallowed and told her that Terry's dog had disappeared somewhere and she had gone off to look for it.
Ginny recalled seeing the little dog when they were out on the trail. She remembered how it had gone running off into the woods, barking at a squirrel or something. And she suddenly realized that she hadn't seen the dog since then. Muffin, Terry called, combing the brush along the trail. Muffin, here girl. He stood perfectly still and watched the girl approach. He imagined what it would be like to kill her, the way he had killed Alice, or the way he had killed Ralph, the way he would kill all of them, one at a time, drawing it out so that each death would, if only for a little while, quench the relentless flame that burned within him. Muffin, here girl. It had begun with Alice, the sensation of holding her while he drove the ice pick through her skull, sensing her terror when she realized what was happening, feeling her life draining away. It had awakened something deep within him, some primordial predatory instinct that made him lust to kill again. Muffin! It was as if some voice within him urged him on, commanding him to kill. After Alice, there had been a brief respite from the frenzy that had made his head feel as if it were about to burst. It made his chest feel tight, and it was difficult to breathe. He had felt as if he were on fire, burning up. Here, girl. Here. Muffin! For a little while, after he had killed Alice and brought her home to mother, it had gone away, and then it had returned once more, even stronger than before, much stronger. After he killed, he felt relief again, but it didn't last very long. This time it came back not only stronger than before, it came back faster. He felt it now, the tightness in his chest, the shortness of breath, the fire in his mind. Terry, Ted shouted in the distance. Lunch! She stopped, not twenty feet away from him, and turned around. Okay, I'm coming, she yelled back. She took one quick last look around and started running back down the trail toward the picnic area. Terry was starting to get worried about Muffin. Her dog had never run away like that before. What could have happened to her? Paul's threat to take them running after lunch turned out to be nothing more than a bluff, and much to their relief, he consented to let them have a free afternoon for swimming after his first aid lecture. While everyone changed into their swimsuits and gathered at the lake, Sandra took Jeff aside. Jeff, she said, looking around to see if anyone was within earshot. You ready? He looked puzzled. For what? Camp Blood, she said, her eyes lit up with excitement. He made a wry face at her and shook his head. Come on, Sandra. You know we're not supposed to go near that place. Oh, come on. It's only a short walk, she urged him. They'll never even know we're gone. He looked reluctant. Jeff, I'm serious, said Sandra. I really want to see it. When we get back to the city, we can tell everyone that we were there. He hesitated, undecided. She took him by the arm and pulled. Oh, come on, you chicken shit. They checked to make sure that there was no one watching them. Then Sandra said, Okay, let's go. And they quickly slipped away into the woods. They walked through the trees for a short while to keep out of sight. And then they cut back down the trail following the shoreline, heading toward Camp Crystal Lake. While the other counselors swam and sunned themselves down by the lake, Jeff and Sandra made their way toward the deserted Camp Blood. Like a couple of kids 
playing hooky. They enjoyed the feeling of doing something that they weren't supposed to do. They held hands and followed the trail as it wound its serpentine way around the lake. Before long, they reached a place that had once been a large clearing, perhaps a packed dirt parking lot, only now it was covered with dead leaves and overgrown with weeds, brush, and young saplings. Moments later, they came to a rusty barbed wire fence. Affixed to it was an old metal sign that said, No Trespassing. Part of the fence had fallen down, allowing them easy access. It was almost as if they were being invited in. This must be it, said Jeff uneasily. Sandra took his arm and moved a little closer to him. She seemed to have lost some of her confidence. Yeah, she said, glancing all around. They stepped over the fence and entered the ground of Camp Crystal Lake. Camp Blood. There seemed to be something ominous about the place, a feeling that was almost tangible. Sandra wondered if it was something about the place itself, or if she was experiencing strange vibes because she knew about what had happened here. She recalled her older brother who had gone to school in Los Angeles, telling her about the time some friends had shown him the ranch where Charles Manson and his murderous followers had lived. She hadn't even been born when the grisly Tate La Bianca murders had shocked the nation, but years later she saw the events depicted in a film called Helter Skelter. There wasn't much left of the place, her brother had said. Only the gate posts and foundations, pretty much all that remained of the infamous Spawn Ranch where Manson played satanic guru to his followers. But he told her there was an eerie atmosphere about the entire area, an aura that seemed pregnant with foreboding, as if the former tenants had left behind an indelible, evil, spiritual impression of their presence. And that was exactly how she felt right now. It was almost as if the place was haunted. Though, of course, that was ridiculous, but nevertheless, there was something about it that had made her draw closer to Jeff and look around nervously. They were all alone out here, but she was starting to have the most particular feeling, as if someone, or some thing, was watching them. They could see the ruins of several cabins. A couple of them looked as if they'd been burned down. The boards were blackened and rotting, and the structures were overgrown with weeds and ivy. It was as if the woods were trying to reclaim the place, to swallow it and wipe out the memory of what had happened here. Sandra, feeling very scared, glanced at Jeff and saw that he too looked uneasy. Oh my God! Sandra suddenly said, stopping and pulling back on Jeff's arm. He jumped about a foot, startled by her reaction. She pointed down at their feet, at the remains of a small animal. All that was left of it were a few tufts of fur and shattered bones, some entrails and some bloody meat that had been half devoured. It looked freshly killed, as if it had just been torn apart. Looks like... like a dog, Sandra said softly. They all knew that Muffin was missing. Jeff bent down to look at it more closely. He grimaced at the smell. Too mangled to tell, he said. Sandra swallowed nervously. What do you think did it? She said. Jeff shook his head. Wild animal, I guess. There was a knot forming in Sandra's stomach. What if it wasn't a wild animal, she thought. What if it was something worse? The feeling that they were not alone grew stronger. 
She wanted nothing more than to leave this creepy place. Perhaps her imagination was running wild, but she was even starting to think that she could hear footsteps approaching. She screamed as a large hand reached past her, grabbed Jeff by the shoulder, and spun him around violently. They stood face to face with the beefy deputy sheriff of Crystal Lake. He did not look very happy. Behind him, through the trees, they could see the flashing lights of his squad car on the dirt road leading to the camp. What are you kids doing out here? He snapped. Jeff glanced at Sandra as if to say, Well, that's another fine mess you've gotten us into. They were marched back to the squad car and told to sit in the back seat behind the steel grating. Then the deputy slammed the door and got into the front. They noticed that there were no door handles on the inside. Sandra wondered if they had been placed under arrest. Weren't they supposed to have their rights read to them first? She was tempted to ask the cop about it, but decided that under the circumstances, it would be better to say nothing. They were driven back to the counselor training center, and everyone saw them sitting in the back like common criminals as the squad car pulled up to the main house with its lights flashing. The deputy ushered them into Paul's office, and they stood with their heads lowered, feeling embarrassed as the policeman read Paul Holt, the riot act. You're gonna have to keep your people away from that place, Holt. The deputy said in a tone that brooked no nonsense. It's condemned. Next time I catch anybody over there, I'm going to run them in. It wasn't his fault, Jeff spoke up, feeling guilty that Paul had to sit there and take the blame on their account. He told us not to. Paul interrupted him. Let me handle this, he said. I might even get a warrant against you the deputy added, looking at Paul threateningly. Oh, really? Paul said, raising his eyebrows, not looking intimidated in the least. Ginny walked in carrying a clipboard as if she had done some business in the office, though it was only an excuse to see what was going on. She saw Paul sitting at his desk, looking up at the big cop who towered over him. The deputy placed his hands on the edge of Paul's desk and leaned forward toward Paul. Look, Holt, he said. People say what you're doing with these kids is great. You've got a good reputation. But if I was you, I'd have located in the next county. He paused. You're too close, he said. Things have been quiet for five years. And that's the way we want to keep it. So do I, officer, Paul said. So do I. He glanced at Jeff and Sandra standing behind the deputy. Okay, you two, he said. Take off and I'll talk to you at dinner. Thanks, Mr. Holt, said Sandra, wanting nothing more than to get out of there. It won't happen again, Jeff said as they walked out the door. The deputy turned to watch them leave and then looked back at Paul, obviously aggravated. That's it? he said. You're not even going to reprimand them? No punishment? He couldn't believe it. What kind of place is this? Jenny, said Paul. Yes, Paul. She glanced at the cop briefly, then looked at him. No seconds on dessert for Jeff and Sandra tonight he said with a perfectly straight face. Ginny suppressed a smile. Disgusted, the deputy shook his head and left. Sandra was very quiet as they walked away from the main house, heading down the path toward their cabins. Jeff looked at her with concern. Fortunately, it hadn't been such a big deal with the cop. They'd gotten off easy, yet something was clearly bothering her. You okay? he said. She took a deep breath and sighed heavily. Should we tell Terry? she said. You know, about what we saw.
Jeff thought back to the remains of the small creature they had seen, torn to pieces at Camp Crystal Lake. He could imagine how Terry would react if they told her about it. No way, he said empathetically. As far as I'm concerned, we didn't see a thing. As Deputy Winslow drove away from Paul Holt's Counselor Training Center, he wondered if he had been too easy on those kids. He had definitely been too easy on Holt. That much was certain. Man, he thought, you try to do a guy a favor, and all he does is give you a hard time. That bit about no seconds on dessert was an obvious slap in the face, a complete disregard of his authority. You try to give a guy a break because he comes to town with good intentions, Winslow thought, because he moves in with his own business. That was good for the community, admittedly, and it was a very small business, and only a seasonal one at that. But it was a business just the same, and you always tried to help out the local business people. Things were tough enough, what with the new mall under construction over in the next town, and everybody planning to take their retail business over there. So far, three of the merchants in town had already made arrangements to close down their stores in Crystal Lake and reopen in the mall when it was completed. At least four more that Winslow knew of were thinking about it seriously. Their overhead would be much steeper at the mall, but they would have a lot more walk-in trade. And they were dying in Crystal Lake. Hell, everyone was dying. Angie Black had packed up her herbs and folk remedies closed down her plant nursery and moved right out of town. She had gone to the big city where she planned to open up some sort of occult supply store or something. She said that the city people were suckers for things like that. Tarot decks, astrological readings, incense and whatnot. She said she simply had to come up with a new wrinkle and make a fresh start someplace else. It had been the same thing with Tom Dunn and his smoke shop. He just couldn't make a living in Crystal Lake anymore, so he had closed up and moved away to New York City. Doc Hansen had moved away too, bought into some partnership with several city doctors in a medical complex, and Miss Willis over at the elementary school had quit her job and gone to Colorado to become a writer. It was like that everywhere, thought Winslow. Small towns were dying all over the country, but Crystal Lake was particularly hard hit, especially after what had happened here. Everyone was leaving. Even the sheriff was talking about quitting and going out west to someplace like Wyoming or Montana and getting a job on the highway patrol or some county police force. Winslow had always hoped he'd have the chance to be promoted, but it wasn't going to be much fun being the sheriff of a ghost town. And the way things were going, that was the way Crystal Lake was headed. Paul Holt was the first one to come into town with a new business in five years. The Chamber of Commerce was eager to keep him happy, and as a result, he had pretty good relations with the people in the town. But although Winslow was able to appreciate what even the smallest business could mean to Crystal Lake's economy, he was still far from convinced that Paul Holt's type of business was the sort that they really needed. The members of the chamber had argued that if he could make a go of it out there on the lake, it could bring more people into town. Other camps would send their counselors there to train in the beginning of the summer. And perhaps some more summer camps would open up out there. If things would pick up again during the summer, then more tourists would be coming in. And if they came during the summer, things were bound to pick up during the hunting and fishing seasons later in the year. Once they had seen the pretty country, maybe some of those hunters and fishermen would think about moving to Crystal Lake to get away from the big city. You could never tell. 
The members of the chamber said all these things could easily add up to another boom for Crystal Lake. Lord knows they needed it. Besides, they said, with everyone moving out of town, they needed to encourage anybody who came in and tried to make a start with something, no matter how small. Beggars couldn't very well be choosers. Winslow had conceded the point, but he had reminded them of what had happened the last time someone had tried to start something out by Crystal Lake. About five years ago, he had said pointedly, there had been no need to elaborate. They had all known he meant Steve Christie's effort to open up Camp Crystal Lake again. They had remembered all too well the murders at Camp Blood. You really want another summer camp out there? Winslow asked. You really want more kids running around in the woods and getting into God knows what sort of trouble? Having sex out there and smoking dope? That was what started it all last time, remember? But they hadn't listened to him. They still clung to the dream that someone would come out to Crystal Lake and see how beautiful it was and maybe decide to buy up a big piece of the lake property and put in a development. Condos, Winslow thought with disgust. Sweet Jesus. You never know, the members of the chamber had said. Maybe one of the kids who'll come out there to that training center Holt is running will have a father who's a big wheel in real estate development. It wasn't so far-fetched an idea. It could happen. Yeah, sure, don't hold your breath, Winslow had thought. But since they were the ones who paid his salary, he had gone along with it and promised to give Holt every break he could in case any of the kids got a little out of hand. That was precisely what had happened, and young Mr. Holt couldn't even be bothered to show his appreciation. Worse, he had responded with complete contempt for police authority. But what the hell could you expect, thought Winslow, that Holt wasn't much more than a kid himself. Kids nowadays simply had no respect for authority. It came from having parents who were too damn permissive, Winslow thought. He should have locked those two kids up to teach them a lesson, and then made that smart ass Holt post bail, or else explain to their parents why their children had been slapped in jail while under his responsibility. If he had done that, he had a feeling Holt would have probably deprived them of a lot more than just seconds on dessert. In any case, that was the last break those people would ever get from him. His thoughts were interrupted as a figure suddenly darted across the road in front of him. Someone had burst out of the bushes to the side of the road, running directly across his path and plunging into the woods. It happened so quickly that Winslow didn't get a very good look at him. He barely had time to slam on the brakes. He struck his steering wheel with his fist. He couldn't believe it. He had just gotten through telling those people that the property was condemned and that he wouldn't tolerate any more intrusions there. And now, here was another one of them heading right for the old camp. He opened the door and stepped out. Hey, he called, after the rapidly retreating figure. Hey, you! There was no response. Whoever it was continued running. Winslow could hear him crashing through the underbrush. With a curse, the deputy took off after the fleeing figure, pursuing him on foot. Hold it, he shouted, furious at not having his commands obeyed. He swore under his breath and continued running through the woods, stumbling over fallen logs, pushing branches away from his face, and breathing hard from the unaccustomed exertions. Too much beer at the roadhouse every night after his shift was taking its toll. Damn kids, he thought as he tripped over a vine and almost fell. That's it. 
That's absolutely the last straw. You give them an inch and they take a goddamned yard. Well, this time they were going to jail. He was brought up short by a small stream. He could no longer hear whomever it was he was chasing. He stood perfectly still for a moment, listening for the slightest telltale sound. But the woods suddenly went completely quiet. Even the birds were silent. There was only the sound of the wind rustling through the trees and the water trickling over the rocks. He bent over and peered intently into the shallow stream. Yes, there they were. Footprints in the mud of the stream bed, not getting eradicated by the flowing water, meaning that whoever it was had only splashed through the stream a few moments ago. Winslow leapt across the stream, not quite clearing it and getting his feet wet. He stopped for a moment, breathing heavily, and then he continued jogging through the woods. He'd had about enough of this nonsense. Whoever it was would be awful, goddamned sorry when he caught up with him. An experienced backwoods tracker from years of hunting in this country, Winslow was easily able to spot the broken branches where his fleeing quarry had plunged through the thicket on the opposite side of the stream. He pushed through into a clearing littered with dead leaves and dried pine boughs. The branches overhead caused the waning light to break through the clearing in diffused beams, which gave the place a soft, eerie glow. Across the clearing from Winslow stood a dilapidated two-room cabin, little more than a tumbled-down shack patched together with tar paper, corrugated tin, and old rotting boards nailed up haphazardly. It was overgrown with weeds and ivy and covered with moss and fungus where the wood was disintegrating from the moisture seeping through. Winslow looked around and saw a blackened foundation a short distance away on the opposite side of the clearing. It was mostly crumbling concrete and charred beams, all that remained of another cabin that had burned down some time ago. He had pursued his quarry directly to the grounds of the long-abandoned Camp Crystal Lake. Judging only by the appearance of this one cabin, or what was left of it, someone had actually been trying to preserve it, although in a very sloppy way. His first thought was that perhaps some of the younger local kids had found this securitus back way into the camp from the country road, thereby avoiding the dirt road that led down to the camp from the other side, where they might have been spotted. He thought perhaps they had tried to patch the old place together so they could use it as a secret clubhouse. It was just the sort of thing that kids would do, and he really couldn't blame them for it. He'd gone in for the same sort of thing himself when he was just a kid, but he'd have to put a stop to it immediately. These old ruined buildings were dangerous. They should have been torn down a long time ago. Some kid could fall through a rotting floor, or the roof could cave in. There could even be snakes or poisonous spiders living in these crumbling old hulks, since they liked rotting wood and moist, dark places. Winslow was thinking about secret hideouts as he walked up to the cabin, but when he pushed through the squeaky wooden door, those thoughts fled from his mind at once. He gasped and his face twisted into a grimace of disgust and disbelief as he looked around the interior of the cabin. The stench was unbelievable. A floorboard creaked loudly as he stepped inside. Holding his breath and waiting for his eyes to become accustomed to the dim light, the inside of the cabin was thoroughly trashed. Pieces of the roof were missing. A grime-encrusted window on one side barely let in any light at all, and the glass was gone completely from the window on the other side. 
replaced by a filthy, moth-eaten scrap of cloth tacked over the frame like a sort of curtain. However, not even the cool breeze that came in through the busted window could dissipate the nauseating smell inside the place. It was the stink of urine and feces, the smell of rotting food and decomposing flesh. Winslow knew that homicide detectives in the city often smoked cigars and cigarettes when they had to go into a room where a dead body had been laying undiscovered for several days because the odor of the burning tobacco helped to mask the smell. However, it would have taken an entire burning field of tobacco to even make a dent in this overpowering stink that made his eyes water. One of the pantry doors was hanging by a rusted hinge. Another was missing entirely, revealing empty shelves caked with dirt and grime, shrouded with spiderwebs and littered with rat droppings. Dirty work clothes that looked as if they'd been picked out of some trash heap were thrown together in a filthy pile beside an old, stained mattress with the stuffing coming out of it. Scraps of food and the rotting remains of small animals such as squirrels and rabbits were scattered here and there about the room. There were several candles, and on the shelf beneath the cracked and peeling cabinet were a couple of unbelievably filthy iron pans encrusted with dried blood and grease. Patched together, broken furniture was scattered about the room, and a rag of a curtain concealed the entry to another room. Half expecting to find his quarry hiding there, Winslow reached for the curtain. A sudden bang behind him made him spin around, his hand going for his holster. However, it was only the rusted through hinge holding up the pantry door, finally giving way and allowing the door to fall, crashing to the floor. Winslow sighed with relief and turned back to the curtain. He pulled it aside and recoiled gagging on the incredibly foul odor that assaulted him. It was a bathroom. The water had, of course, been turned off for years, so the toilet didn't flush. The evidence was incontrovertible. Someone had actually been living here, but living like some savage beast in the most subhuman conditions imaginable. This was no secret clubhouse for young kids, but the home of some half-human derelict, some pathetic, mentally incompetent bum who had somehow stumbled upon this place and taken refuge here. So much for the legend of Jason Voorhees, Winslow thought. Here was the answer. The explanation for all the reports of figures skulking through the night and picking through the trash heaps, shadows briefly glimpsed just off the wooded trails, mysterious rustlings in the night just beyond the campgrounds, and the occasional thefts from the outlying homes located on the edge of town. Some miserable, homeless, benighted wanderer, a pathetic mental patient cut loose from some hospital because his insurance had run out, had taken refuge in this long-abandoned cabin, running off into the woods and hiding whenever anyone came near. This was how the whole thing got started, Winslow thought. Everyone was afraid of nothing more than some pitiable, crazy bum who was merely trying to stay alive. He looked toward the heavy wooden door leading to the back room of the cabin where the poor bastard was probably hiding like some wounded animal, scared of his own shadow. Well, no one should have to live like this. He'd go in there, cuff the poor guy, and take him off to jail. Hell, he'd be doing him a favor. The food and living conditions there would be at least 200% better than what he had out here. 
And in the morning, the judge would hold a hearing and they'd find some place, some home or something that would take him. Winslow put his hand on the rusty metal knob and turned it. The door creaked open about an inch or two, then stuck. He grunted and pushed at it. It moved a little more but still resisted his efforts. He stuck the toe of his boot into the crack and put his shoulder to it. With a loud creaking sound, the door swung open. Winslow staggered into the room as the door suddenly gave way before him, and what he found inside stopped him short, as if he'd run into a brick wall. His eyes went wide with horror, and his breath caught. His knees became weak, and his stomach felt as if someone had kicked him there. He suddenly felt dizzy as his mind rebelled against the unacceptable reality of what was in the back room of that rotting cabin. He grasped the door jamb to steady himself. He felt faint, overpowered by the awesome smell and grisly sight that suddenly confronted him. Oh my God, he whispered unable to tear his eyes away from the tableau before him. Behind him, a board creaked softly, a hand raised a pick hammer high overhead, and before Winslow could react to the telltale sound behind him, the hammer came down with brutal swiftness, striking him in the back of the head, the pick's point smashing through his skull and burying itself deeply in his brain in one savagely powerful blow. Winslow felt a brief incandescent moment of searing pain, and then all feeling went away forever. He was already dead when he crumbled to the floor.